Coming up on Focus, step outdoors with PBS 39. Brittany Garzillo steps onto the banks of the Monocacy Creek in Bethlehem for a special focus on fly fishing. And I travel to Cabela's in Hamburg, Berks County for a beginner's guide to archery. Plus, digging your bicycle out of storage, Rover Silcock shares what you need to know before you ride the road or trail. These stories, plus Lehigh Valley Zoo, stops by with some special friends on this episode of Focus. Focus showcases the people, places, and issues that matter to you. Everybody has a story. These are the stories that uplift and inspire right here in your neighborhood. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest. Banking. Insurance. Investments. Fellowship Community. Continuing care with spirit. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I'm Laura McHugh. On this episode of Focus, we step outdoors. Pennsylvania is home to 120 state parks, a million licensed hunters, and a number of high-quality fishing holes. Focus reporter Brittany Garzillo explored a tributary of the Lehigh River and joins us now. Brittany? Thanks, Laura. More than 85,000 miles of streams and rivers flow throughout the state of Pennsylvania, home to many different types of fish and varieties of fishing. Recently, I stepped outdoors and spent the day at the Monocacy Creek in Bethlehem to try my hand at fly fishing. The babbling waters of Bethlehem's Monocacy Creek provide residents and visitors of Northampton County a glimpse of the great outdoors. I'm all fishing. During trout season, the Coldwater Creek serves as a spot for licensed fishermen like Eric Brosick of Bethlehem to fly fish. Fly fishing is the method of fishing where you use fly line, a fly rod, and an artificial fly to catch fish. Brosick is the president of the Monocacy chapter of Trout Unlimited, a national nonprofit cold water conservation organization. He started fly fishing about 12 years ago. It's different than other types of fishing in that we don't use live bait. Typically, we're not using any molded plastic representations of bait. Instead, artificial flies, which mimic natural insects, are used to lure fish. The goal of fly fishing is to catch a fish using insects that are tied by hand and presented as naturally as possible to the fish so that they take. There you go, thank you. David Bittner, owner of Heritage Fly Shop in Allentown, ties and sells dozens of varieties of artificial flies. We have various feathers and furs. Each material has its own property that will give the fly the ability to either float or sink or look realistic in the water. Here he shows us how to tie a crane fly using orange and gray thread and a rooster feather. The process requires a keen eye and a steady hand. So basically we're locking in those fibers with the fine thread and now we have to tie a knot in the front. We can cut the feather off. It can be quite enjoyable to tie the different flies and then go out and see whether you can catch a fish on the fly that you tied. If you can fool them, then that's what it's all about. Hoping to fool some fish of our own back at the Monocacy, Brosick and I start fly fishing with an artificial fly called an elk hair caddis fly. In this case, made with deer hair and a rooster feather. The gear that we're going to use that's typical to fly fishing is a fly reel, which holds the fly line, a fly rod, which is typically a little bit longer than most fishing rods. The fly line is attached to a leader down to our fly. Trout fishing is um, really rather big in the Lehigh Valley. If you were in this park on opening day, there would be people shoulder to shoulder lining both of these banks fishing for trout. It's almost like a tradition for a lot of people. A tradition that I was eager to learn by fly fishing firsthand in the flowing waters of the Monocacy. This is an overhead cast, okay? Where the line's actually gonna come up off the water, go behind us, and then come back and lay down on the water. Okay. 
The one thing about fly fishing is that when you cast, a lot of line can be in the air, so you have to be a little bit more aware of your surroundings. And start with your rod tip low. Good. Go for it. Stop and down. You did it. Fly fishing is a little bit different than fishing maybe that people started out doing when they were a kid with a bobber and a worm. So there's a bit of a learning curve, so it takes some patience. After practicing and testing my patience with both roll and overhead casts, I head to the car to suit up in waders. Ready to go. And hit the water. So, yes, that was a lot, much better. Uh, it's nice to get out, uh, get in the water, get away from everything, uh, reconnect with uh, nature and uh, the challenge of hooking a trout. I do feel lucky to be in this area. After growing up in New Jersey and have to travel from South Jersey to my streams, almost an hour and a half. Now I can travel six minutes and get here and be ready to go. Stream supports a really big population of wild trout that live here, they breed here, they make new baby trout every year, and it sustains the population. We're really lucky to have that. We got one? We got one. Lucky for us, our day in the water concluded with a catch. In the net. This is a wild brown trout. He was born in this stream. We have a really amazing resource right here in the Lehigh Valley with these streams that are cold and clean. His advice to those who plan on fishing during trout season? Look at the Pennsylvania Fish Commission rule book because regulations change every year. Though rules and regulations may change year to year, for fishermen like Brosick, one thing remains the same. I think the biggest thing about fly fishing or, or maybe just fishing in general is that you're concentrating very specifically on one thing, trying to catch a fish. You're not thinking about other things that are happening in your day-to-day -day life. Now that's a breath of fresh air. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzello reporting. Thanks, Brittany. Set in the bucolic Trexler Nature Preserve in Lehigh County, the Lehigh Valley Zoo welcomes more than 175,000 guests. Here to tell us more, the zoo's general curator, Richard Rosphere, and marketing manager, Alan Raisman. Thanks so much for joining us today. I see you brought some friends with you. We did. <laughs> we'll talk more about them in just a second. But Alan, what's new at the zoo? Lehigh Valley Zoo is open every day from 10 until 4. We have events all year round and activities every day at the zoo on April 11th. Uh, the reason why this little guy is here, he's one of our animal ambassadors. We opened up our reptile and amphibian discovery center on April 11th. It's our first indoor exhibit. It's very exciting. We have snakes, crocodilians, lizards, uh, frogs. It's a wonderful exhibit. We hope everyone comes and visit, uh, visits us. And all year round, we have events and activities. People can join us for um, Endangered Species Day, which, which happened last weekend. We have um, party for the, for the planet in April. In July, we have Red, White, and Zoo. Uh, we, <laughs> have, um, we have a music concert in July, um, Zoo in Paradise. In August, we have a 10K and 5K run. September, we do movie night. Other, October is beautiful in the zoo with all the leaves changing. We do Otter Tubber Fest and Boo at the zoo, and all winter long is winter light spectacular. Lots of stuff going on, sounds like it. A very um, large amount of activities and events. Great. Well, could you tell us, Rich, about who you brought with you today? Uh, this is a Solomon Island skink or a prehensile tailed skink. As you can see, the tail is wrapped around my arm because they have that a tail that they can use for climbing like a lot of old world monkeys do or possums. They can actually use that to help them climb. Uh, they're arboreal, that means they live in trees. Uh, and that's why he's, he's trying to climb now. He has very uh, long claws to grip into the bark and that tail to hang onto branches. Do they hurt when he's climbing? Uh, no, he's not uh, not hurting me right now. He's not trying to uh, use those claws for defense or anything. Where where does the skink originate from? Uh, the Solomon Islands in the Pacific Ocean. Wow. So he's far from home. He is. He keeps sticking his tongue out. Is there a reason for that? Uh, much like snakes, they uh, lizards will use their tongues to detect what's around them. They bring in odors from outside. They have an organ on the roof of the mouth. Uh, which then pick, uh, uh, takes that message to the brain and they can figure out what's around them. And what do they eat? Uh, this is mostly a vegetarian. Okay. Uh, they eat fruit, lots of leaves, uh, and they might occasionally take an insect. Will they change colors like a chameleon? Uh, no, they don't change colors like that. He might get a little bit lighter or darker depending on his mood. 
but uh, doesn't actually change colors. How big will he get? And uh, could possibly get twice his size that he is right now. Wow. And so if you w went to the exhibit, you would see this guy there? We do have these uh, in the exhibit, uh, Solomon Islands exhibit, where we have uh, uh, a pair of these skinks, and uh, we plan to have a Solomon Island leaf frogs as well. Wow. You know how old he is? Uh, he's about four, I believe. Mm. Very curious little fellow we got there. <laughs> and he's one of more than 300 animals we have at the zoo, over 125 different species. Wow. And I know you brought another friend with us, so maybe while you find that friend, <laughs> okay. can we touch this one before we put him sure. away? Where's sure. the best place? Just along the back is and fine. What's it feel? What's it going to feel like? <laughs> Ooh, leathery. Yeah, it's very smooth, he but it's dry. They're not slimy. Oh. A lot of people think they're wow. slimy, Are they but they aggressive? have very dry skin. No, not at all. Mm. They're not aggressive. No. Mm. Wow. Well, Brittany says she wants to see the other friend that you brought with us, but right. I'm not so sure. What do we have? You'll be fine with him. <laughs> okay. Rich says Let's I'll be see. fine with him. We have him in this little box here. Yes, Earlier, I, I heard him hissing. Hissing. <laughs> <laughs> My skin is crawling right now. I'm so knowing excited. Knowing what's inside. Uh, in our uh, amphibian and reptile building, we have uh, exhibits that represent animals all around the world. We have the Solomon Islands, we have a uh, Amazon exhibit, we have uh, a, ca <laughs> a cave <laughs> exhibit. Uh, plus some local animals, including our local venomous snakes. This is a. This is venomous or no? This is not venomous. No, I would certainly not be handling it like this. Uh, and it would subject you to it if it was venomous. <laughs> uh, this is a Sonoran Mountain King Snake, which complements our desert exhibit, uh, which also has a Gila monster, which is a venomous lizard, one of the few venomous lizards. Uh, also a couple other lizard species, a Chuckwalla and a uh, desert iguana. And yeah, if you just want to touch them on the back, you can. <laughs> <laughs> this one's real curious. <laughs> and his tongue is the same color as his skin. It's like black and orange almost. Ooh. Is he a meat eater? They are. Uh -huh. they, they are carnivorous. They eat rodents, probably small birds. Um, and this also... Maybe other sna and other snakes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. he, Ooh. he also originates from the south? Uh, from the southwestern United States. So while many folks are afraid of snakes, they actually serve a purpose. Absolutely. They're out there for a reason, or mm -hmm. they won't be there. Uh, they, they, uh, snakes like this are big on rodent control. Um, in fact, a good many snakes are good for that reason. Well, thank you so much for bringing these friends <laughs> with you, Rich and Alan, and we hope to see you at the zoo soon. Thank you for inviting us. Yes, thank thank you. you. The sport of archery dates back at least 5,000 years. In the United States, almost 19 million people participate in the sport, and that number is growing, both in bow hunting and target shooting. Part retail store, part natural history museum, Cabela's draws 7 million people a year to its largest location in Hamburg, Berks County. We have our aquarium in the front of the store. We have our African diorama, our conservation mountain, 45,000 square foot um, deer country museum. A lot for everybody to see. You just don't have to be a, a hunter or a fisher you know, to, to come to Cabela's. We have something for everybody. We navigated our way through 250,000 square feet of outdoor gear and indoor exhibits to the archery section, where we met retail marketing manager Harold Luther. The nice thing about archery is it levels the playing field. You don't need to be you know, tall, you don't need to be you know, fast or athletic. Um, there's a bow that um, can fit everybody, get everybody on the range and shoot efficiently. Easy for Harold to say. Standing more than six feet tall, he first picked up a bow at the age of four. And though he no longer shoots competitively, he still practices every day. It's a passion. You know, once you start shooting and enjoy it, you know, it's hard to put it down. Harold's just one of more than 300,000 people with an archery hunting license in Pennsylvania, a figure that's steadily increased since 2007. We've really seen target shooting um, increase the last couple of years, especially with women and children. And uh, you know, thanks to a movie such as The Hunger Games, you know, a lot of people want to get out and shoot a bow for the first time. So that's what we're here for. 
He showed us the two most common types of bows, the popular compound bow. And the nice thing about this is when you draw back, um, it decreases the weight of the bow. It makes it a lot easier to draw back and um, aim and shoot. And the more challenging recurve bow. They take a lot more practice and a lot more patience to shoot. Can I give it a try? All right, let's go into range and get this started. All right. About 10 yard range and the, you know, the whole premise is so people can try before they buy. And I was ready to try, both the bow and Harold's patience. After protecting my hands and arms, I go through the motions on a recurve bow. My arms are shaking. Yep. And trade it in for a model better suited to beginners. Pull back with this arm, push with this one. Put your index finger right in the corner of your mouth. No way. Then when you're ready, let go. You have really good form for your first time. You say that to everybody, I'm sure. No, maybe. <laughs> Nine arrows later, bullseye, giving me a new appreciation for a sport that's thousands of years old and still right on target. For Focus, I'm Laura McHugh reporting. This month, PBS 39 will participate in an event at Steel Stacks in Bethlehem called Step Outdoors. To tell us more about what to expect, we welcome the event organizer from ArtsQuest, Mark Demko, and executive chef, Michael Hoffman. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so Thank much you. for having us. So what is Step Outdoors? Step Outdoors are two days of free family fun designed to introduce people to all the wonderful outdoor pursuits in our region. Uh, children have a chance to come and learn to shoot a bow, to cast a fly rod. We're going to have urban hikes, cycling rides, and so much more. There's more than 25 different groups led by ArtsQuest, the zoo, PBS that are going to be doing hands-on activities, presentation for kids, and so much more. It's coming up Saturday, May 30th, and Sunday, May 31st. Absolutely. Hours are 10 to 5 Saturday, 10 to 4 Sunday, and you can visit the website steelstacks.org to get more information. Would you share with us some of the more unusual things you'll be featuring? Absolutely. Um, one of the events that's going to take place is we're going to have opportunities to have hikes over to the sands where people can see wild live peregrine falcons. Uh, peregrines are endangered Ooh. in the state of Pennsylvania. I had no idea we had them on the campus. Uh, absolutely. There are only two nesting pairs in the Lehigh Valley, so this is really a rare opportunity to see the birds. On one of the days, the uh, Pennsylvania Game Commission's falcon biologist is going to be here leading a talk in the walk. So it's, that's really an exciting opportunity. Uh, we're going to have an opportunity for people to try some wild game dishes like venison tacos, uh, wild boar sausage, and even insects. Insects? Is that where insects. Chef Hoffman comes that's where in? where we come in, right? Um, <laughs> what? We're going to have a chance to try both barbecued crickets and salt and pepper mealworms. What do you mean we? Yeah, we? Well, all of us, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, we're one of the few countries in the world that don't eat bugs. Entomography has been going on for years. T uh, it's called tomography? Entomography. Entomography. And that's the science. It's Greek for literally eating and cutting in half. So um, it's just eating bugs. And we have many opportunities here in our own area to eat bugs. We don't recommend you go out and just catch bugs outside because of all the pesticides and stuff that people spray. But if you do go to a pet shop or um, somewhere where you can buy insects, crickets, or mealworms, you just want to bring them home in the container. You put them in your freezer for about 10, 15 minutes till they're euthanized. It's a very natural way of doing it, just like Mother Nature does with winter. And then you clean them off, rinse them off with some cold water. And uh, with these, we just uh, toss these with a little barbecue dry rub, put them in, put them in, <laughs> put, put them in the oven, make sure the fan's off. Um, and with these, we just sauteed them up with a little fresh cracked black pepper and kosher salt. I'm assuming you've tested them as I have. the chef? Yes, I have. Um, they're very good. The mealworms are my favorite. It tastes just kind of <laughs> like a piece of dry noodle. Um, the crickets are great. Every once in a while, though, you'll find a leg maybe later on in your teeth. Ooh, okay. So, uh, other than that, no, they're really good. And like I said, we're the only country that really, Europe's not as big into it either, that does not partake in eating bugs. And a three and a half ounce uh, portion of crickets will give you up to 40% of your daily protein. I was gonna say, I've heard that crickets are high in protein. Huge in protein, right? very low in fat, very healthy for you. I mean, we just saw the skink earlier, he looked great. Um, <laughs> and, and He's a big bug eater. Big bug eater, loves the <laughs> yeah. bugs. So, Absolutely. you know, if he can do it, then, you know, why can't we? And they do it all over the world, and we just haven't caught on to it. We're behind. We are behind. Yeah, yeah. we're behind. You know. So if we started with one to try first, which one would be the best? I suggest the mealy worm. It has, uh, it's mm. just the easiest one to, to take down. Um, 
<laughs> the you moment Grover's so been waiting for you, Grover. Thank you. I'll try a nice, juicy one. Are you going to try one, Brittany? Oh, there it goes. Course. Okay. Uh, you know, I've seen my Grover. grandson's uh, gecko eat this, and I thought, wow, that looks good. All right, Mark, will you try Do we have to cheers first? Yeah. All right. I'm going to try a really small one. Mm. Did you guys try it already? Yes. They're really not bad. Okay, it's not bad. It's kind of like a, like a little crunchy noodle. It, yeah, or yeah. a potato okay. chip or something like that. A little that. salty, a little yeah. crunchy. Yeah. They're good. Salty. Now, if you go and buy these and do it at home, you might want to put just some grain down for them so okay. they eat a clean grain. Kind of like if you catch catfish, you want to clean out there. <laughs> you know, okay. know what they've been eating. And these are the barbecue grasshopper, uh, crickets, excuse me. Now, I'm a little bit more hesitant for this one. These aren't bad. These have barbecue rub on it. They're okay. really not bad. You said they mm. aren't bad. You're not saying they are good. <laughs> this is not my favorite sit down at TV to watch the football game and eat crickets. You know, but this one can still look at you. That's what kind yeah. of scares these me. These don't have the heads on. The mealy worms do not have the heads on. You they cut do those not. off. Yep. Right. But these do. Mm. Correct. And yeah. Mark, you said All that right. if, you know, insects aren't the way to go for you, you can always use them when you're fishing, Absolutely. right? These two, two of the best trout baits are actually mealworms and the grasshoppers. They're really not I'm bad. looking so around for a bad. really small one. Me too. Do you uh, recommend May a I join sauce you? of some yes, kind? Yes, please, Mark. Plain? I think sauce would kind of, you know, go. they'd be kind of hard Here's to well. If you do travel down to Mexico, they make tacos with these and they do put, you know, stuff on them, um, sauce on them. They're not bad, right? Just taste barbecue. They're, They're not The bad. flavor isn't the problem. Yeah. Textually, it's a little odd. It's the fact that I still have pieces in, in my, my mouth. mouth. Exactly. Yeah, I would have recommended a drink here, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, some water or something. But uh, you know, they are there a little dry. Um, so I think everybody's misconception of them is when you eat a bug, you're gonna have all that squishy stuff inside. Exactly. Yes. Um, I I was in the Marine Corps for several several years, and we learned to eat bugs more in a survival aspect, and they were raw. So then you get the squishiness. But these, they're cooked, they're, it's just like eating anything else. So you're not going to get any texture inside other than... Well, well, luckily we're out of time before I yeah. we have to get ourselves into anything else. Thank you both for joining us. No, thank you. Well, it makes sense that May is National Bike Month. After all, cycling comes alive in spring and runs clear through fall. Let's turn to Focus reporter Grover Silcox to help us get ready for the cycling season ahead. Grover? Thanks, Laura. The Lehigh Valley offers cyclists a variety of cycling opportunities from the 165 mile DNL corridor and the Valley Preferred Cycling Center or Velodrome to simply riding through the region's tree lined neighborhoods, small towns, and urban core. If you haven't gotten on a bike in some time, you might need a refresher course in getting started. If so, here's some advice from two local experts. When warm weather comes, Cyclists spring into action. Riding on the road uh, really doesn't require any sort of special bicycle. Mark Taylor, an avid cyclist who sells and services bikes at South Mountain Cycle Shop in Emmaus, offers some advice for those interested in getting back on a bike and riding around the neighborhood. As long as you have a safe working bike and a good helmet, you've got everything you need to get started you know, riding around town, commuting, riding on the road. You'll want a brightly colored helmet so motorists and others on the road can see you. According to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, wearing a well-fitted and properly placed helmet has been estimated to reduce head injury risk by 85%. Helmets are mandatory for riders 12 and under in Pennsylvania. A lot of folks are comfortable riding a mountain bike, something more heavy duty on the road, which is not dissimilar to uh, driving around an SUV. Typically a road bicycle is gonna be lighter weight, narrower tires, more efficiently rolling. Mark and his fellow cyclists offer some rules of the road. If you go on the web, there's Pennsylvania rules of the road for cycling. It does go over basic safety, basic rules, ride on the, the right side of the road. If there's not a shoulder, you are able to take the lane avoid riding on the sidewalks. It also becomes a danger at any sort of intersections. Signal when turning and stop completely at stop signs and be safe and set a good example. Mark also recommends carrying a water bottle and taking a sip every so often before you actually feel thirsty to prevent dehydration. You can also invest in clothes to keep cool and comfortable. Cycling shorts are generally padded 
and they're also designed to reduce the layers to prevent chafing. So you don't actually wear anything under cycling shorts. If you're not comfortable with the, the tight style shorts that are available, these also have a liner inside that provides some padding. Uh, they're also designed to mix wick moisture away, so they're going to be uh, cool in the hot summer months or when you're riding and, and sweating. You'll also see that most of the jerseys are going to have pockets across the back to carry snacks, accessories. At Bike Line in Allentown, manager Scott Kleinschuster suggests a hybrid bike for trails and dirt paths as well as paved roads. The hybrid is, is pr the perfect bike for the Lea Valley area. It's very easy to use. It's a very comfortable bike. Positioning on a, on a hybrid gives, gets you upright so you can see what's coming. And then underneath the seat, you have a shock absorber. So the saddles are a wider, more comfortable saddle. That... The tires are a, a cleated tire to the side. You have a little tread over the side here. You do have a smoother section on the tire. So it's a very easy rolling and very easy pedaling. On this particular bike, you have seven gears in the back and three in the front. So you're going to have a gear ratio that would make it comfortable and very easy for you to pedal to go up the hills or to pedal the bike uh, at a faster rate if you want to work out harder. Seasoned cyclists recommend that you select a bike that fits your interest and is adjusted for your size and comfort. We size the bikes for you, fit the bike properly to you, make sure that you have a comfortable saddle on it, that you have the proper handlebar positioning, that you, you're within safety of, uh, of making sure you can get to all the controls of the bicycle. You'll also want some accessories on your ride, such as a spare inner tube, tire levers, patch kit, and hand pump. Some people, um, they're a little bit you know, timid of trying to fix something on their own, but you know, any bike shop will probably go through some of those basics for you to make sure that you've got the understanding of how to take a tire off. To get rolling, you can spend between $350 and $500 for a mid-level bike, around $50 for a helmet, and another $150 plus for accessories at a reliable bicycle shop. But once you make the initial investment, your bike, with the proper care, can last a lifetime or more. I never exercise. I just ride bicycles. It's not a no pain, no gain scenario. I always enjoy riding my bike. It just happens to be good for me. And a great way to spend time with friends and family. For Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. So this show gave each of us an excuse to get outdoors. <laughs> Grover, how bike friendly is Pennsylvania? Well, actually, uh, we are the 12th uh, most bike friendly state in the country. We stepped up from 19th uh, over the last couple of years thanks to a uh, transportation project that was uh, passed by the legislature. And it, uh, it uh, actually allocated uh, over $2 million for bike trails and bikes and things like that. And in the state of Pennsylvania, as we mentioned, archery is growing in, in popularity as well. And I will tell you, I was very sore after doing that, um, especially through this part of my arm and on my forearm. And I asked Harold why that would be, and he said it's because they're not muscles that you use very often. Huh? Ah, that's interesting. <laughs> See, mine was the opposite. With fly fishing, it's just a light flick, so you don't want to give it a lot of power. So those are some of the techniques that I've learned and hope to continue in the future. It really was an excuse to get outdoors and to yeah, exercise some different kinds of hobbies and activities that we have here in the Lehigh Valley. All right, well, thank you, Grover. Thank you, You're Brittany. Welcome. And thank you for joining us. We'll leave you with a shot of our audience from Dunnigan Elementary School and Lehigh Valley Dual Language Charter Schools in Bethlehem. Thank you for joining us. And remember to focus on what matters.